hello. Uh, welcome to the National Coalition Against Censorship and New York Film Academy Filmmaking Workshop. Um, we are very excited to, um, to be doing this event. Um, we at NCAC, uh, we do a lot of work fighting to protect free speech and free expression rights for students, um, fighting book bans in schools, fighting for students to be able to express themselves freely. Um, so we're really excited uh, this year to be launching our film contest uh, with this event. Um, we will talk more about the film contest um, a little later. Today, we are very lucky to have Andrea Swift and Jonathan Whitaker from um, the New York Film Academy who are going to give you some, um, some really excellent tips and insights on filmmaking. And then we're joined by Molly Smith and Sage Croft, who are our most recent winners of the Youth Free Expression Film Contest. Um, and they will talk a little bit about that, about the, the contest and winning and getting involved. Um, and then we will be joined by Gordon Danning, who runs our Youth Free Expression program here at NCAC. And he's gonna talk a little bit about free expression and um, the theme of of the film contest, which is gender expression in schools. So we've got a stacked um, schedule today. So uh, we're going to jump in. Um, about questions, we are going to um, ask you to put those in the chat, and then we will compile them and, and answer questions at the end um, to try to make sure that we can get through everyone today. So as the the workshop is going on, if you have questions, just throw them in the in the chat and. Um, we'll be circling back to questions at the end. So I'm gonna go away because you don't wanna hear from me. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Andrea Swift from NYFA. Andrea. Hello, it's great to meet you all. Um, I'm chair of the filmmaking uh, department and documentary division at the New York Film Academy. And um, I have been asked to introduce you to microdocs. So I'm gonna do that by just diving straight in. Well, first, I'm gonna apologize uh, right up front to the digital um, natives here because I am a digital immigrant and you're gonna to have to put up with me trying to make technology work, but we'll get it done. All right, assuming you can see my screen now. Um, so as I said, like, let's just start by watching one. My name is Kevin Kamala, representing Avani Eco. We're trying to replace this uh, so-called petroleum-based plastic products back to what the nature has created. Undeniably speaking, plastic is convenient and it's very affordable, yet causes harm much more than 20 to 30 years. We're hoping that one day biodegradable products would be uh, the status quo, of course, for the use of plastic. These are 100% compostable and 100% biodegradable, made from industrial cassava starch. Here's a piece of a cassava bag in which I'm tearing apart and putting this into a Slightly lukewarm water. Our cassava bag has passed oral toxicity tests and causes zero harm to nature. It's diluting almost spontaneously, and within just one minute, it becomes a green drink for a greener Indonesia. Cheers, boys. <laughs> You may have actually uh, even seen that particular micro doc. It's made pretty good rounds. I'm going to try resharing my screen, see if I make sure I can, that it's optimized. Yeah, it is um, for video. Okay, so one of my favorite things about micro docs is that they <clears throat> really put an enormous amount of power in the hands of anybody, anybody who has a smartphone. 
um, can do this. And um, this is uh, this one particular one was made by one of our grads. I've I've actually had a little bit of difficulty getting people to do it, but he did, um, and he's now my case study for it. Uh, so this film, you know, they don't really have names, but we call it edible plastic bag so that we can call it something. Um, it went out on social media and was shared uh, pretty far and wide, pretty big success. Um, I'm going to quickly compare that to um, to other forms of documentary distribution because th these are in the documentary arena. So let's look uh, first at how far the um, biggest box office of any documentary in the history of the world reached. Um, what happened? I lost a Okay, don't know how I did that, but I'll tell you. Um, it was the Fahrenheit 9-11 by Michael Moore. And if you do the math on the box office numbers, um, it basically reached about 11 million people. Once you move on to the net, it changes the metrics considerably. So I was trying to find a reference point for something that was um, nonfiction, uh, activist, um, and and online, and that everybody watches. and um, I picked TED Talks, which if you guys have not encountered, check in with TED Talks. They're pretty amazing. Um, their most viewed documentary uh, reached 63 million views. So pretty far. And then just a bigger context, like what the most watched uh, single uh, television event in American culture, of course, is the Super Bowl. And at the time I put these numbers together, the biggest one had been in 2015. I think this last one was bigger, but we'll use that one. So most watched event like in the US, 114.4 million people, which is kind of huge. Um, if we were interactive, I'd ask you to guess how far Gary's little micro doc we saw just went. Since you're not, I'll just tell you. Reached 150 million views, um, right? Significantly more than the Super Bowl for a 21 year old kid. Um, let me give you some uh, background on those numbers. So this was as of uh, November of 2017, um, and the numbers are aggregated across platforms. There's no place where you can just see this, this film got 150 million views. It's on Facebook and Instagram and uh, Bright Vibes reshared it and now this reshared it and it just went out on a whole bunch of different platforms. So he had to go around and count up all the numbers everywhere. And um, at that point it was 150 million views. He has not been interested since November of 17 to, to update it, but I'm guessing, you know, there's probably been a few more um, since then. Another one of his films uh, had already reached 20 million views by 2017, microdocs. Um, so what does that mean? When I'm saying the word microdoc, what's a microdoc? Well, uh, first I've got to disclaim, this is my word. Um, oh, I, I was asked to teach the Fulbright folks how to do this, um, you know, how to make a kind of thing that there was no name for. So I had to name it, so I've named it microdoc. It's kind of become the name that people tend to use. Uh, I'm guessing I'm not the only one that thought of it because it's a pretty logical name. All right, so, but this definition is, is completely mine. Okay, one, very small documentary, thus micro. Generally less than five minutes. They've, uh, they get bigger and smaller. There's now some that are like 15 seconds long on TikTok and some that are a little north of five minutes. But that's, you know, 90 seconds to five minutes is sort of the sweet spot. Could be a sweet, yep. The big deal here is that it's optimized for viral distribution right, by a social media. Um, so it's a social media arena, which is what differentiates it, differentiates it from just, you know, other kinds of very short docs, right? And they are frequently intended to change the world a little bit, just like what you guys may be doing if you jump into this um, contest, right? So owning it, it's just me. Um, that's my definition. Okay, let me show you another one of um, Gary's for our next jump forward. <laughs> We built two plastic bottle kayaks out of plastic bottles in a bamboo frame and used them to go down the world's most polluted river, the Chitaram River, located in Indonesia. Plastics is having a major toll here in Indonesia. 
being the biggest archipelago in the world. We really wanted to create a shocking visual of all this trash that's coming in from our rivers into the ocean. We have to start from our rivers because that's where we can still capture the waste before it gets out in the open sea. Being raised in Bali, we truly wanted to make a difference by bringing our plastic bottle kayaks in one of the most important rivers of the country, but the most polluted river in the world. I would put my paddle in the water, pick it up, and it would just be covered with plastic bags. I'd be paddling next to dead dogs, dead pigs. The smells were awful. But what shocked me the most is definitely the fact that all these people are living next to the river with very little conscience of the effects that this pollution actually has on them. The power of floating down on plastics really is to engage people that trash is a resource and it's a valuable material. It can be reused for other things. So this expedition is not yet over. This is just the beginning of a fight against plastic pollution in our rivers. Okay, so that's Gary's, um, not exactly next, but uh, in the next uh, year of what he did, this was their um, next uh, expedition. So um, this one also went viral, though I cannot tell you how viral, because it mostly was in Indonesia. Um, there's a fair amount worldwide, but most of it was in Indonesia. And apparently the way that they share most in Indonesia is via WhatsApp. And there's no metric for tracking it. We only know it went viral because the uh, press, or the first way we knew, was that the press started tracking them down at the stops they were making along the river and doing pieces about them, and they became, you know, kind of famous. Their whole point in doing this was exactly what they said. They're trying to get uh, rivers cleaned up. Basically, they started as being people very worried about ocean plastics in the oceans and realized that, you know, the way to stop plastic in the oceans was to stop it before it came out of the rivers. They moved up to that. So they were hoping to raise some awareness and reduce the amount of plastics that came out of the Chicharum River, right? So they wanted to change the world a little bit. Often what it is we're trying to do. Did it, right? That's the next question. Did it in fact change the world a little bit? Well, this one I've got to click over to. Let's see, unshare. It's a new one that I've added in. It hasn't always been there. This is literally the situation I'm in right now. All this trash. It's like everywhere. So we're just looking at some of the smaller creeks that are going into the Chitaram and it's insane. Look at that. So all that goes inside the river. Setelah melihat film itu, saya sudah bikin usulan penerapan tanggap darurat terkait dengan pengenanganan sampah di Citaru. Empat bulan ke depan kita bikin namanya roadmap. Seperti apa kita harus berbuat misalkan penunjukan pelaksanaan dan penyiapan kebijakan pendukung dalam satu koordinasi utuh. Bicarakan dengan Pak Gubernur, bicarakan dengan Pak Kepala DLH Provinsi dan beberapa 13 wilayah itu tadi bagaimana peran kita yang akan ya, kita lakukan di dalam pelaksanaan Sungai Citarum dan harus bersama-sama untuk menjaga Sungai Citarum terpanjang di Jawa Barat menjadi sungai yang lebih baik dan lebih manusiawi lah. Okay, so uh, not bad, huh? 
this thing just goes out wild, goes viral, and the government actually found them and reached out and said, you know, oh my gosh, we're so shocked to learn how polluted the river is, we're gonna fix it. Well, just a little trick, a uh, little uh, heads up, that may happen when everybody's looking at them. People pop up and say, oh, you know, we're gonna fix it, and then when nobody's looking, you know, they don't fix it. So um, what happened here? Let's look at what they managed to do. This little piece that you guys just saw actually made a huge difference. It was very clever of him because he just recorded them saying they were gonna do this and then told everybody they were gonna do this and uh, see how that worked out. you will see that Chitarum River in seven years will be the cleanest river. I commend Indonesia for really being at the core front of this environmental battle to fight the pollution epidemic. It has opened up a discussion on pollution on a national level. I think the gathering of all these different communities coming together proves to be the most powerful weapon to really bring change. Indonesia is now sending out a message to the world that it's not too late, that there's still hope to restore what we've destroyed. Water is life, it's our most important commodity, so we need to restore one of our world's most important waterways, Indonesia's Chitaran River. I don't know if you clocked that one, but that was the president of Indonesia who was announcing uh, together with Gary um, that they were gonna clean up the Chitaran River. 7,000 jobs for seven years. It's pretty major. And they're doing it. They're now three years in. They've made enormous headway. They've built waste recycling plants. They are replanting the trees along the river. They're, um, it's huge. They've shut down the fast fashions dumping of waste into the river. Um, it's, it's getting pretty close to drinkable at this stage. So not bad for a 23-year-old kid with a camera, um, right, who sets out to change the world. There's some more, but I'm gonna jump over it because I wanna get you to another person, right? To uh, you sort of point out that this isn't, while it is unlikely that you're gonna get a government to change their policy to that extent, it's happened, it could happen. And it's not completely, um, uh, it, it's not a complete anomaly. So here's, here's something another one of our grads made, um, which went out via a platform that was then called Mike, uh, and went somewhat, somewhat viral, though I don't have the numbers for it. Here we go. Executed sentence of death. My name is Alice Marie Johnson. I'm a 62 year old mother, grandmother, and great grandmother. In less than two weeks, this October 31st, we marked by the 21st year of confinement in a federal prison. One of my family members spoke one time. And I, I'll never forget that they tell me they come in to visit me in prison. It's like, it's a great sight. They said that they can see the place where my body lay, but they can never take me home again. After my jury trial, I was sent to life in prison. Life offered me no opportunity for parole because there is no parole in the federal prison. When I lost my job, I struggled financially. I couldn't find a job fast enough to take care of my family. I felt like a failure. I went through a complete panic. And out of desperation, 
I made one of the worst decisions of my life to make some quick money. I became involved in a drug conspiracy. I missed the birth of grandchildren, being able to be in their lives. I just had a great grandson. I missed that. Both of my parents had passed away. I was not able to be by either of their sides in their final days. That, that's an ache that I kept that never goes away. I am not a sector in society. One of the things I'm most proud of, I write plays. And the plays that I write have been viewed by literally thousands of women. It is so exciting to find talent and women that they never knew they had, to recognize it and develop it and to show them that you can do this. So I'm, I'm very proud of being able to, to mentor other women and to help them do their time too. When the criteria came out for clemency, I thought for sure uh, in fact, I was certain that I met and exceeded all of the criteria. I had 100% clear conduct for the entire time of my, my entire time in prison. No disciplinary infraction. I'm a true first-time non-violent offender. Even the prison staff wrote letters about my accomplishments in prison. I had letters from members of Congress, the outside public. Oh my goodness, I had so much support. I was denied again with no explanation given. So it leaves me wondering what more I could have done. The real Miss Alice is a woman who has made a mistake. If I could go back in time and change the choices that I made and make different choices, I would, but I can't. But what I have done is I have not allowed my past be the sum of who I am. Please wake up America and help end this injustice. It's time to stop over incarcerating your own citizens because that is what is going on. Um, all right. Pretty moving, right? I'm turning off my video, by the way, when I play this so it'll play more smoothly. Um, this one also went um, viral, not uber viral like Gary's, but it started getting around. And in fact, you guys may be aware of what happened next in this story. Uh, it may start to tell to sound familiar. It ended up by some way or another on Kim Kardashian's desk of all people. And Kim Kardashian took Miss Alice's case to Trump in the White House. Familiar yet? He, he um, gave her clemency and she got out of prison and, and perhaps more importantly on a, on a big scale, um, it restarted the conversation about sentencing reform um, in federal prisons, something that the Democrats have been trying to do for a long time. The Republicans were resistant, but once Trump came out in support of uh, Miss Alice's, you know, the injustice that she was living, um, suddenly the Republicans came to the table and there have been some serious conversations going on about sentencing reform. So that's another way somebody uh, managed to do one of these um, and, you know, change the world a little bit. This I think is fun. It's this nice, nice little meta post where Reese Witherspoon is posting about our graduate, Kendall Seesmeyer, um, and her story leading to Kim Kardashian and Miss Alice being out of jail. So I think that's kind of fun. And that takes us to, all right, so you ready to go change the world? You've got the power in your hands, you've got the, the power in your brains, and it turns out you also indeed have the power in your hands. Um, so what was, what's that mean? That means that you have a superpower that is sitting in your pocket or your bag, um, and that is your smartphone. Um, people underestimate the, uh, power of the camera in their smartphone. It's not just for messing around. It actually gives you a way to potentially change the world or to make a feature film. This, uh, the slide you're looking at now is the poster from a feature film called Tangerine. 
um, which came out, uh, I'm going to not even guess the years, a few years ago, fairly recently. And it was the big hit of Sundance and was the big sale of Sundance that year and was shot with an iPhone 5S. So I think it was about seven years ago. You know, there's a good chance that uh, your phone is at, at least that good and, and quite possibly much better. There have been films made with smartphones that are not even that um, high resolution as there is in the 5S. Um, and it's not just a one-time fluke. Okay? Here's a bunch of other features. You're not going to be making features right now, but here they are, more feature possibilities. This is Steven Soderbergh, who made um, Ocean's Eleven, uh, has made his last two or made two recent films on uh, smartphones. Michelle Gondry, who did The Eternal Sunshine of Spotless Mind. Um, over here, Claude, uh, Jenna Bass, obviously, Claude Lelouch, who's one of the grand old directors of the French cinema, actually recently made a film um, of his using a smartphone. And then um, Midnight Traveler there in the middle of the screen, I think is uh, sometimes the one that is, you know, uh, for what we're doing, it's the most appropriate. It's the story of a family who had to flee Afghanistan in the middle of the night and just, you know, grabbed what they could put on their backs and took off. And there's no way anybody could have been carrying a movie camera, but you know what they were carrying? Their phones. And they started shooting what was happening to them with their phones. And eventually, uh, after they were somewhere safe and settled, the father of that family cut it all together and created this film, Midnight Traveler, um, which was a big hit at Sundance and also at Berlin and ended up with sale and uh, did pretty good uh, business made with a variety of not super advanced smartphones, um, right? So uh, I'm going to skip this because I'm running tight on time, uh, but it's just to show you <laughs> something great that I personally, well, I'll do it while I just talk over the top of it. Um, the value of this is that uh, I shot this with my iPhone, other than the super close uh, wildlife shots and the drone shots were shot with my iPhone. This is the S Plus, which has the capacity to see the but I didn't do, uh, didn't do it right, so I didn't turn off the thing. right coverage. I was shooting the students while they were shooting whales. Um, and I did that. And you guys have seen how I am with technology, right? I mean, we're not talking about slick, advanced technological genius here. We're talking about me. So I would propose that if I can do this, you can do this, right? And I'm showing you something that's, uh, I guess, my, my raw there we go. My little uh, transition wasn't quite as elegant as I would like for it to be, but throw back out there again. If I can do this, right, you can do this. And Jonathan is now going to pop over and tell you how. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Um, thank you for, you know, it's so, so inspiring to me to see those stories and to see you know, how, what, what an impact you can make. And hopefully it's inspiring to our student uh, filmmakers out there today who've come to join us because that's what you're about to embark on, that, that journey of creating content that hopefully becomes the piece that changes someone's mind and instigates change because you do, you do have that power and you do have that voice. And as Andrea said, there's, there's no better time to have, to be empowered to get your story out there than today's you know, day and age with the technology that we have. And so before I jump into that though, um, I did want to remind everybody that we, we hope to have a robust Q&A at the end of this. So please feel free to pepper that chat room with any of the questions you may have. Someone is monitoring it. And while we're not going to address them now, we will address the questions at the end. And of course those questions can, we would certainly be about the contest um, about the National Coalition Against Censorship and what they represent, um, but also questions about filmmaking. 
uh, if you have questions to, for Andrea about, about story and, and docs and the power of micro docs or questions for me about, um, about filmmaking. So my name is Jonathan, as you, can, as you know, Andrea introduced me, and I am also one of the chairs of the filmmaking department um, in New York uh, at the New York Film Academy. Although I, I oversee the short-term programs, so anything that would be from, say, less than a year uh, to as short as two days, uh, I would oversee that. But I'm also an educator and a, um, a director and a producer and spent many years, uh, early years of my career, which is going on 30-some years now, um, it's a slight, slight exaggeration, 20, mid-20s I've been working. Um, I worked in the camera department in G&E, and so today we're going to talk a little bit about harnessing that power that uh, Andrea so eloquently spoke of and using your mobile device and leveraging that to get great content. But first, before I jump into that, I did want to talk about just the power of story. Right? I, as you saw from Andrea's examples, um, you know, someone making a, a micro doc and that really motivating change in the government uh, policy. Um, and it's just so powerful, and stories in general, right? I mean, stories are the way that we understand the world around us. Um, stories are a dress rehearsal for the brain. You know, we, we, we watch a story and we, we kind of relate to it and go, I could see myself in that situation. And it's the most persuasive uh, way to, to win an argument. Uh, or to to get facts across, you know, people are, I forget the exact fact, but it's like 20 times, 22 times more likely to remember a fact if it's couched in a story than if you just gave a fact. So if like you're trying to get statistics out there and say, you know, X amount of people, this happens per year, right? You can tell people that, fa that, that fact and they might go, wow, that's a big number. But if you really want it to resonate and you really want them to remember it, you put it in a story. Right? I mean, you see, politicians know this, right? Any great politician uh, spins a yarn. They tell you a story about somebody to illustrate the point that they want to make. And so it's really important that, we, that we're setting out to tell stories um, because that sets the highest order, right? Stories tap into our emotional side. And it's the emotional side of us, as much as we like to pretend we're rational human beings, it's the emotional side that actually sets the hierarchy of priorities in our lives. Um, so then that begs the question, then what is story? Um, you know, what makes for effective storytelling. And of course, I'm not going to be able to, to cover that in, you know, the next 20 minutes. Um, but I do want to just give a quick preview of it because sometimes we lose track of it. And it's actually not that complicated. Um, although not everyone is a great storyteller, but you can be if you know the important elements. So what are the important elements? Well, in order to have a story, you need a, a character, right? You need somebody or something that maybe has uh, like has some type of per human traits to it. That something, that somebody, that character needs to want something. Right? There needs to be there needs to be an objective, a goal. And then, in order for it to be a, a compelling story, then you need some conflict. You need something in the way of that goal. Right, I, I can tell you a story. I can say, hey, you know what? Um, this morning I woke up and I was very excited to come to this to this National Coalition Against Censorship uh, kickoff event. And I was like, what am I going to teach today? And I was very excited. And, you know, I got here and here I am. It's awesome. Good story? No, not not a good story. And you wouldn't hurt my feelings if you said so because I know it's, it's a really bad story. Uh, because you know why? Well, I had a goal. I woke up. I wanted to be here and I'm here, right? But <laughs> Who cares? You know, where, where, where is that struggle? Where do we reveal the character? Now, if I said like, you know, like, so I, I was really excited to do this workshop, you know, and so last night I was up all night working on my presentation and I kind of, I stayed up a little bit too late. And so I guess I kind of overslept because I woke up this morning and all I heard was this buzzing sound. And I didn't know what it was. There was a fire alarm going off. And I looked down, it was actually my alarm. And, but I jumped out of bed to grab it. And I jumped out of bed. I, I hit my head on the floor and I'm laying there. And I'm starting to bleed. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't be on camera with this. And so I, I get up and I run to the bathroom. And as I run to the bathroom, I realize my kids went on the locked the door from the outside. I locked myself in the bathroom. So now I'm there with blood coming down my head. I'm trying to get out, right? You get the point. I'm getting a little bit carried away, but that's a better story, right? Because there were there were obstacles in the way of me getting to where I am right now. So just just keep that in mind, right? You're you're going to go out there and you're you're aiming to tell your stories. You're aiming to uh, you know say something um, that is unique to your voice, and, and people need to hear that. But make sure that they're listening by telling a good story, by telling something that's a complete story, because it's through conflict that character is revealed. And it's the characters that we come to see that work as the, our emotional surrogates as we go along on that journey. So that's my spiel about story. Um, it can be very powerful. Uh, we need to be able to tell it. But let's talk about then shooting it and harnessing 
that power that you have called the mobile device. And so I'm going to share a presentation as well. And sorry if I'm speaking too quickly. I get, as you can tell, I get very excited when I get to talk about story and things that I love. Um, so some tips for mobile device video. And as Andrea said, this is probably silly. I mean, you all probably are more comfortable shooting with mobile devices than, than someone of my age. But I'm going to share with you what I know anyway. Uh, some of this is applicable to cinematography in general uh, or videography. Uh, but some tips for working with your mobile device. Because, again, you know, it is incredible. I mean, the, the camera that is in a device like this is more powerful than the camera that I had in graduate school, uh, you know, at, at a very well-known institution. So let's talk about them. What do we have? Well, one of the first choices you have to make, right, is, is how are we actually framing it, right? Framing is so important. It's understanding how we actually put the rectangle around uh, our, our, our content, around our subject. And so, you know, before you go and hit record, right, you want to know what type of story you aim to tell. And so we have two main choices. We have, um, we have a portrait mode, which is here in the left, and then landscape uh, on the right. And so how, what is the orientation of it? Um, there's no wrong or right. I mean, you decide what is wrong or right for your story. But I would say for, you know, for most people, if they wanted to have uh, a low barrier to engagement, when it comes to screening something via a social media platform and on a mobile device, and they typically shoot it in portrait. Uh, I, I, for years, was shooting content for Snapchat. They had their own content creation um, uh, outfit or part of the company of Snapchat. And we shot everything in portrait mode, although oddly enough, not on a phone. We would get a rig where we have a camera and we would uh, tilt it to, it was always on its side. But then we have uh, landscape mode. Landscape is if you're telling you know, a, a short film, if you're aiming to tell, um, you know, something maybe scripted or doc, but, you know, if you need the extra real estate on the side that you want for, say, a widescreen format. So how are you, what, what is the orientation, right? Again, that's your first, one of your first creative choices that you need to make. Um, understanding the exposure elements of your device and of your camera. And so clearly, you know, you, we've all done this where you just turn on video on your phone and you go and shoot, and that can be okay. But now you're really at the mercy of the auto settings for that particular unit, whatever that uh, device is, your mobile device. Um, and auto settings, they can work, right? They can work, they'll give you a nice general exposure, but you're really throwing away one of the creative tools that we have, right? All, all Everything that goes into the camera and to the lighting aspect of the cinematography are tools that we have to better tell our story. Um, what we aim to do is to create kind of the visual metaphor, if you will, for what the characters are going through. And, you know, so much of that does come from the way that it looks, the way that we're exposing it. So if you just kind of open your camera uh, app in your phone, you won't have access to all of these. But there are a few um, additional apps you can download that would give you access to be able to unlock the potential of your smartphone. One of them is something called Filmic Pro. Uh, Filmic Pro, I, you know, obviously I don't work for the company, so I'm not shilling for them. Uh, it is a paid app, um, but it does have a lot of um, a, a lot of tools within there, and it gives you a lot of control over uh, your exposure and your frame, and even the the gamma and, and color space that you're using. Uh, a free option is one from Adobe. If you have an Adobe account, which you can have for free as a student, uh, you can download Adobe Rush and you can go ahead and um, generate content just in that app. But both of those would give you the ability to play with some of the elements here that we have that, that govern exposure. So what are those elements? Well, um, of course there's the amount of light, right? That's just the amount of light that we have that is either present because we're using uh, natural light or it's the amount of light that you're using when you're setting up your film lights, but we measure that in foot candles. So we're going to leave that aside, right? Because we're going we're to assume that that's a, a fixed variable for now. And so let's talk about what we would do inside of the mobile device or a camera. Well, one of the first things you could play with is the aperture, um, the iris setting. And everyone who's ever looked at their own eye knows that there's an iris, uh, there's an aperture in the human eye right your pupil which opens or closes um, hopefully automatically uh, based on the amount of light that is available to form the image on the rods and cones inside of the eye so a camera has that as well the iris opening and so it, it is a it's a diaphragm that opens or closes um, you would be able to set it if you have manual control uh, 
um, inside of a camera. You would see it, there, the, the, the pupil can open or close, what we call f-stops. Unfortunately, most of the apps that you would be able to download for your smartphone do not give you an iris, uh, an aperture, uh, variable aperture, because it is fixed in a device like this. But that is one of the factors that governs it. Another one is the ISO or the speed. Um, ISO, EI, ASA, they all mean the same thing. Uh, they're all different acronyms, but they all mean what is the sensitivity of the camera to light. And the higher that number, the more light sensitive. The lower that number, the less light sensitive. And so that is something that you can, you can play with in your device if you had one of those apps. You can just go and slide along and change the ISO. One of the things that you'll start to notice, though, is that because every device has a native ISO, right? It's native means like when it came out of the factory, um, this is what it was rated at. That's the native ISO. And, and if you're allowed to play with it a little bit, going lower than that native or higher than, you'll see it does change exposure. But not only does it change exposure, it also changes the quality of the image. The higher the ISO, the more light sensitive, but also it starts to degrade the image because you're putting, you're boosting the luminance signal within the, the, the sensor and you're starting to get digital artifacts, what we call noise. Um, it actually, it's almost a direct equivalency to what we used to do with film stock. In film stock, it wasn't, you know, you weren't adjusting kind of the algorithm inside of it, changing the sensitivity, but you were changing different film stocks. Um, and that, the, the speed of a film stock came from the size of the, the, the crystals, the silver highlight crystals. The larger they were, the faster the film stock was, the smaller they were, the slower the film stock was. But the larger they were, the more grainy the image was because you're actually seeing the grain structure of the crystals. Anyway, ISO is, is one of the things that you can adjust uh, in your device. Uh, another one would be your frames per second. And that, that's how many frames are you acquiring per second uh, to form your video. Um, standard, of course, is 24 frames per second. Um, standard for video in the States is, is 30, 29.97. Um, but if you want to shoot things with less motion blur um, or more motion blur, you can deviate from those. But that actually ties into our shutter speed or exposure time. And so, you know, oddly enough, there's not really a, a there, there is no shutter in a digital camera. Um, in a film camera, of course, there was. And the shutter is the device that opens up to allow light or to block light from entering and striking the film stock or, or the sensor. Um, but they, they do put shutter speeds or exposure time in, in your device, and you can unlock that as well. And so that means, again, how fast would that shutter be spinning around? Or what is the increment of time that you're allowing that sensor to form each individual image per, you know, for every frame? And so with a higher shutter speed, which means a smaller increment of time, say 1 over 100, that would be 1 one hundredth of a second, um, you're going to have less motion blur and less exposure because it forms the image more quick or more quickly. If you went with a lower shutter speed, say like one over 30, one thirtieth of a second, clearly that's a lot more exposure time. So you're going to have a brighter image and also more motion blur. What would be considered normal is whatever frame rate you're shooting. If you're shooting 24 frames per second, 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second, take that frames per second, multiply it by two and put a one over it and that would be what normal would be for um, for motion blur and what the human eye would see and so exposure it, it is you know again it is one of these tools right because we can talk about getting proper exposure and we can play with these elements to get quote unquote proper exposure but proper exposure is really what what what's what's right for your story what are you trying to say there could be times when you want to underexpose the image on purpose because you know you want to have very deep dark shadows and you want the majority of the frame to be uh, uh, underexposed and in shadows because we want to withhold information. There are other times where you might want to overexpose it, where we're losing, we're losing data in the highlights because it's too bright and it's going into the white clip. Um, maybe you want to communicate something about the way the character feels about going outside for the first time in a while. And it's like so bright, it's, it's overpowering to the eye. So proper exposure is really what is right for your story, um, as, as is every choice that you would make when making a film, what is right for your story. But these are the factors that govern um, exposure. So you have your aperture, your ISO, your frame rate, which ties into your shutter speed. So one of them is how much light are you allowing to come in? The other one is how light sensitive is the acquisition system?
And the other one is how much time are you allowing that light to come in and to strike that acquisition system? Let's talk about continuing to use the camera, um, camera mobile device as a visual metaphor. One of the things that you'll notice um, when, when, when you look at different images is the lens that they're using. So most cameras now actually have multiple lenses in them. If, you're, if your device has two lenses on the back of it, if you have like two cameras on the back of it, it means you have two lenses. Some have three and four these days, you know, even like the, the new Samsung, which is like an 8K camera, has four lenses on the back of it. Uh, it used to be you had one lens and that was a fixed focal length and you couldn't change it. But let's say that you are able to change your, your lenses. If you can go from like a wide angle to maybe a telephoto, um, changing the, the, the focal length is going to drastically change the way that the image looks. Um, and you can buy additional gear. And so Andrea referenced, you know, some feature films that were shot on iPhones, and they most certainly were. And you do have that power in your pocket. Um, but a lot of them, you know, were built out. They had lenses on them. They had um, different uh, audio devices for capturing the audio. But if you just have like a small lens kit, it's one way that you can really kind of enhance your storytelling. Understanding, again, how we use lenses to create the visual metaphor for what our characters are going through. So if you have a short focal length, that would be a wide angle lens. And if you have just one lens in your, in your phone, it is a wide angle lens because it's more practical. Um, it's just what the manufacturers use. It gives you a deeper depth of field. So the area of acceptable focus on the Z axis will be deeper. Um, it, 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 it's more steady when you're doing handheld because the angle of view is wider, so it doesn't look like it's super shaky. It kind of absorbs some of the shakiness. Um, and it also exaggerates distance. I know this ever happened to you, but let's say that like, it's happened to me many times where you're at a sporting event or you're at a concert. You're like, you want to show everyone how awesome your, your seats are. So you're like, you, you go to take a photograph. And like, I can't believe I'm like just five rows back from, you know, from Billy Joel or whatever. And so you go take a picture. You look at the picture, it looks like you're, you're sitting about 40 rows back. You're like, this doesn't, wait, I can see much better with my eyes here. What's going on? That's a byproduct of the focal length. Um, a wide angle lens will do that. It exaggerates distance on the Z axis. Whereas a normal lens is the most human like. It mimics what the human eye would see and it renders space as normal as an average uh, depth of field, an average field of view. And then a telephoto lens. And so some people might refer to this as a zoom lens. Not really the proper uh, terminology for it, but um, it means it's a longer focal length. In your, if you have a, a phone that has multiple lenses and you can see, it'll say like one times or two times, and you click on that, you click on the two times, right? It's saying that the lens now is twice as long and it went to a longer focal length. And what you'll see, it looks like it zooms in. Well, what it's doing, of course, is magnifying the image and it's making it seem as if it's closer than it is in reality as opposed to farther away, like the wide angle. Um, and so this is what you know, we use this to help to tell our story. Um, to give you an example of a film that took place in one location, but in order to kind of break it up and to, to, to give it some uh, visual variety is a film called 12 Angry Men by Sidney Lumet, the original one. And uh, the film is about 12 jurors who are sitting in a room deliberating over whether or not this young man um, killed his father. Big decision, right? Because if they say yes, he, he, he gets punished by death. If they say no, then he walks scot-free and he could be a murderer. Uh, anyway, the point of it is that these, these 12 men are not very happy, as you get from the title, 12 Angry Men. Um, and they're in this room and they're arguing about many things, you know, but mainly about the court, but other issues come to the surface. But the point of bringing it up is that it all takes place in one room. And so what Lumet did is he decided to break the film down into thirds. And the first third he shot with wide angle lenses, the second third normal, and the third third telephoto lenses. Why? What did it do? Well, uh, with, the, with the first third wide angle lenses, with a wider angle uh, of view, you're able to frame more than one person in the frame. And we were seeing group shots, two to three people um, in the frame at a time. If we see that, we associate them as having some connectivity. But also it exaggerated the size of the room because it exaggerates on the z-axis and so it made the room look larger and again we weren't even cognizant of this when you're watching it but then the second third he switched to normal lenses and now it narrowed the field of view it and it shortened what the room felt like the size of it and so on the subconscious level we're starting to realize that the frame's getting tighter it feels like the space where that we're allotted is getting smaller and the actual, the physical room, it, the, the walls are starting to get tighter. And so we start to feel that on some level. Again, it's not completely obvious to us, but we feel it.
And then for the third third, he went to telephoto lenses. And so now it's a narrow, narrow field of view, narrow angle of view. And so you can only shoot singles, right? One character at a time. And so now that has the sense of isolating these characters. And you kind of feel like throughout the course of this hour, whatever relationship or, or you know, uh, just whatever relationship these characters had to each other has disintegrated because of the argument they're having. And now the room feels like it's really tight, like it's right on top of you. And again, just using the lenses to help to tell the story. If you shot it all with wide angle lenses, we, we would have been missing something. You know, we pick up on this and we use that, you know, again, as, as, as uh, how we understand the story and how we feel for the characters. This is something that, so Lumet was one of the first ones to do it, but NUR2 did it on Birdman. Um, same idea as Michael Keaton's character uh, starts to feel more and more trapped and isolated inside of the theater, right? Because he made that choice to, to put on the play and now he feels like he's trapped. He has to do it. And, you know, in order to kind of great, get that sense of claustrophobia, um, they actually switched to longer lenses as well, even though it was supposed to be one shot, which we, we all know it wasn't. Um, but it directly borrowed from what Lumet was doing with lenses. And they actually, too, they physically moved in the walls uh, of the space as well. So using production design and lenses to help to tell the story. That's something that Scorsese did in Raging Bull. Uh, when Jake LaMotta's character was winning, you know, the ring would get really big. And when he was losing, he would feel trapped and stuck in that space. So if you, so I guess I'm getting at it's like, let's unlock the power of what we have in our pockets, right? One of them is using an app to give us greater control over the auto settings. Another one is maybe using additional gear to, to enhance the story to, and switch between the lenses. I just wanted to show you, I, I realize I'm running out of time too. I guess Andrew and I just have a lot that we like to, to share with you all and talk about. Um, but here's an example of what I mean by, you know, what focal length does. And this, this young lady, that is uh, her in both shots. Um, nothing happened to her face. That is just what a difference looks like between a 16 millimeter, very short, very short focal length, wide angle, to a 200 millimeter, very long, right? Same face, same girl, same day, same lighting, different lens. And so you can really, you, you can tell what it, uh, what, what it really does to it. Um, some additional tips. Um, obviously, always use the rear camera when you're shooting as opposed to the front camera, unless you're doing some type of testimonial where you feel like you need to do a selfie, but it's always going to be better quality. Um, shoot at the highest possible quality for your phone that you can still use the data. So like this one is capable of shooting 4K, right? So 4K means double regular HD. Um, so if you, if you have the space on your phone and then you know that your computer can work with that material as you edit it, shoot with 4K, even if you're not going to display it in 4K, because then you'll have it for archival, you'll have it for re reframing purposes. You can magnify the image twice without losing any, any quality. Um, use the grid feature to help you with framing so you can make some interesting framing choices and elements. And make sure that you're shooting at the proper frame rate. Again, what is the proper frame rate for you? 24 frames per second is standard. And then before I hand this off to my good friend and talented filmmaker, Sage, the last thing I wanted to talk about really quickly was uh, lighting. You know, every one of these devices is capable of shooting in low light conditions, and you've seen it. You can turn it on. The camera will figure it out. It'll give you its auto exposure settings. Um, but lighting is really important, right? Lighting is important for storytelling. Can you just set it and shoot and forget it? Absolutely. But I do want you to think about lighting. How are we using it? And so what we have here is just the most basic lighting setup, um, a three-point lighting setup. Pretty much all film lighting is based on the three-point lighting setup, where you have your key light, your main creative source, something that should be motivated that makes sense. If we look at me, if we look at my image right now, which I'll show you in a second, I'll get larger on your screen. The key light is the window. We have a fill light. A fill light is controlling the contrast ratio, the shadow, and then a backlight. I don't quite have a backlight right now. I have a background light that might be giving us a little bit of depth to it, but the backlight is for the back of the subject. Uh, creating that separation. So do think about lighting. Even if you're doing exteriors, then the sun would be your key light. But how are we bouncing light to fill it in? And what are we using for, for backlight to create separation? Um, but again, lighting is really, really important. Lighting is a way that, you know, you can tell something about the, the, the tone of the character, of the location. You could say something about um, the person, right? It changes the way faces look. It changes. You can control the audience's gaze by having bright parts of the frame, and it creates um, a sense of dimensionality. Um, so do think about lighting. I wanted to show you really quickly what I meant by, so for me, if you look here, the key light is, is the window. It's a sunlight. I can't change that. But the fill light 
really shouldn't even have much of a presence. You shouldn't know it's there, but you'll know when it turns off. So if you look here, that was my fill light, right? Controlling the contrast ratio. This feels completely different than, say, this does, right? And then in the background, I have a slight of a backlight, but it's not quite doing its job. Anyway, um, so th please do think about lighting. It, it can be very important. Uh, your story, unlocking the potential, harnessing the power of your smartphone. And um, I'm actually going to turn it over to two filmmakers who know even better than I because I'm, I'm familiar with their, with their work. They're incredibly talented. They were the winners of the last youth competition for their haunting and moving love letter to uh, their country called Dear America. That's one of those things that, you know, it has, it's resonated with me and I, I, I can actually remember it even though it's been a couple years and I'm a little bit getting old in age. But two talented filmmakers, Sage Croft and Molly Smith, thank you for, for joining us. And um, it's great to see you again. I'm going to turn it over to you if you'll. If you'll... Yeah, no, thank Well, thank you for having us, Jonathan. We appreciate it. Um, I know this project was very personal to Molly and I, and I mean, she can speak on her own behalf too, but I mean, we were shocked by how much people were impacted by this because this was just a very true story to our experience as a high schooler. And uh, Molly, you want to kind of talk about the, the screen, the script writing process and really where the idea came from. Your audio is gone. Okay. Okay, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, yeah, so I wrote the script. It was based off of a poem that I wrote after growing up in Orlando. Um, both of us saw the effects of what it was like being in high school after the Parkland shooting and um, also after the Pulse shooting. Being in Orlando, we were pretty close to that and we knew people that went to Parkland. Everybody knew somebody who knew somebody else at least that had gone to um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. So we were seeing the differences in um, the security on campus would change and there was more locks on the doors and all of those things sort of um, culminated into this poem that I wrote um, sharing my frustrations with um, America and why we weren't addressing this problem. So um, I wrote that script and then um, I met Sage through a film festival. We started talking and I said, you know, I think this would be a better um, project to tackle with two directors because it is such a, um, it was a, a large undertaking for high school filmmakers with limited resources and that way we would have um, more perspectives um, to share because I had grown up going to a private school, he had grown up going to a public school, so that way we weren't um, just showing one viewpoint, we wanted to show um, how all students feel in schools. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, technically, this film was directed by two people, but really, it feels like it was directed by 40 because we really tried to take in the perspective of we talked to our crew, we talked to our actors. We really wanted to get as truthful of a representation of how our generation is feeling and not just our personal experiences, but really drawing on that to make it as honest of an account as we possibly can. And I think that really came through in the final product. Um, I mean, it was it was a long shoot with no again no resources, just a couple kids getting out there. But uh, we just, as artists and as youth in our generation, we just felt like this issue wasn't being talked about enough. We needed more attention on it, and really, we just needed to hear more perspective on an issue that really most directly affected our generation. Um, it really felt like we needed some youth voices talking in media, in politics online and so we put this film out there and we didn't know what to expect from it you know we thought oh you know our friends might like it and we might go to some film festivals and all of a sudden it, i think it really resonated with an audience that was feeling the same thing we were that we just weren't represented in media um so obviously we got involved with the youth free expression and submitted over there and they've been absolutely so supportive of our work and we appreciate that because we think it's important. We think it's essential to continue these kind of conversations and really build on every social issue there is. And I encourage everyone, no matter their beliefs, no matter their stance, just make films that are important to you. Even if everyone hates them, <laughs> just, it doesn't matter. There's someone, there's people out there who are gonna connect with your message and really feel that, you know? Yeah, totally agree. Um, and I mean, the, the film really came together because of just a passion that I had and so much emotion for a cause. Um, that's the whole reason why it came to be. So all it takes is a passion. All it takes is for you to care about something so deeply that you have to make something about it and then you can get it done. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, so I, we're, we're a, 
we're excited to be here again and be able to talk to you guys because really like anyone can do it. Genuinely, anyone can do it. And I really, really encourage you guys to get out there and just shoot it because we shot Dear America on nothing budget. Now we were lucky and we had access to people and people who were excited about the cause, but where there's a will, there's a way. And there's, if you have to shoot it on your iPhone, you have to shoot it with parents as actors, just figure it out. Because 90% of directing is just solving problems. That's literally it. Every, every single person has a director's vision inside of them, but just barely anyone can handle the constant stream of issues. There's never enough money, never enough equipment. You have actors drop out, locations drop. And just that unwillingness to give up or secede, that's, that's it. That's the whole game. Um, yeah, we definitely saw that in the process when we were getting it out online and trying to get views and all of that because nothing goes viral overnight is what it seems like we'll be like oh wow that went viral it seems like just yesterday you know it had 10 views now it has a hundred thousand that's not how it happens at all it there's people behind the scenes working we were sending emails just like messaging people on twitter like hey watch this film like we made this and it's <laughs> most of the time they never watched it or even responded but it was all those little things that we did slowly built up and then eventually um, YouTube started recommending it and finally it started getting those views, but it took a lot, a lot of work. Absolutely. And Gordon, I know that you guys are obviously passionate about sharing these kind of messages and we really appreciate it because again, there's nothing I think is more important than free speech and stopping censorship in its tracks before it can really take a hold. Um, I know you, you want to talk a bit about more about the contest and kind of the mission of it, the goals and really how it's set up. But uh, thank you so much for having us again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thanks, and thanks for the uh, thanks for the intro. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm just here to just briefly uh, talk a little bit about uh, just free speech rights of students in general, well, people in general, and, and specifically uh, students. So, and of course, I have a PowerPoint because you know, what presentation would would what would a presentation be without a uh, a PowerPoint? Let's see. Okay, so, um, and I will try and, uh, I do want to you know, save time for questions again. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. So I will go kind of quickly through this. Uh, just briefly, as, as we said at the beginning, National Coalition Against Censorship, uh, we've been around for about 50 years. We've been formed to advocate for free speech rights of artists and K-12 students. And so obviously, uh, students who are filmmakers are both students and artists, so that, you know, works perfectly. Uh, and I, I did want to just Put in a little plug. If you, anyone you know, has an issue with censorship in schools, uh, you can go to our website and on the very top it will say report censorship. Uh, you can report your question and someone, probably me, uh, will get back to you, I guarantee you, very quickly. Um, so anyway, the, the film contest topic for this year uh, is about showing the importance of expressing yourself and your gender identity through your personal appearance. Um, so, uh, so what does that mean? What does, uh, what does that mean? So freedom of speech uh, is appearance, is personal appearance a type of speech? Um, well, here's what the Supreme Court has said. The Supreme Court has said that speech is not, it's not just speaking, right? It's, it's all sorts of actions that send a message as long as people can figure out what it is. Uh, and so some, some classy examples are, you know, displaying a flag, a Confederate flag, a U.S. flag, uh, you name it, uh, burning a U.S. flag. There's, there was a big Supreme Court case, that, a case about that about 20 years ago. Uh, recently, you've seen people kneeling during the national anthem, both professional players and uh, college and high school players. Some of them have gotten in trouble for doing it. Uh, but is that speech? Absolutely, because it's sending a message. Uh, so, okay, appearances can obviously send messages too. So, so yeah, is your personal appearance a type of speech? Definitely. These people, I think, are clearly sending uh, a message by their appearance, right? Uh, similarly, you know, so are these people. Uh, you know, maybe not such an interesting message, but anyway, they're both, they're all sending a message and they can all, you know, they're all types of speech. Uh, so, does that mean, though, that you can wear whatever you want, whenever you want? Um, you know, the general answer in the United States is yes. Compared to most countries, the United States has much broader free speech protections. 
So the general rule is you can come pretty much say whatever you want. And that includes people who are minors under the age of 18. Uh, minors, as a general rule, have the same free speech rights as adults. Uh, you know, if I want to criticize the president or whoever else, I'm an adult. Obviously, I have a right to do it. I can't be arrested for that. But either can a, you know, a little kid, either can a nine year old, right? Uh, so definitely minors have freedom of speech in the United States. Uh, but there are some exceptions. I'm going to go through them really quickly, just the general exceptions uh, to freedom of speech are things like, uh, you know, defamation, if you lie about someone, you can get sued for that. Um, obscenity is not protected by freedom of speech, but that's not the same as pornography. Pornography is legal obscenity. You don't want to get into, I don't want to get into the, the, the details of what obscenity is. If people want to ask me about that, uh, put it in the chat or, or you can email me. Uh, but uh, obscenity is not protected by speech. Incitement to violence uh, is not protected by freedom of speech. Obviously, it's been in the news lately. Some people accuse President Trump uh, on January 6th of inciting violence, but that's a very, very narrow exception. He probably uh, did not violate the law from what he said. Uh, you know, threatening people is not protected. Also a very narrow, narrow exception. And then fighting words where you kind of get up in someone's face and insult their mother and so they might hit you. Um, that technically is not covered by freedom of speech. Uh, but pretty much everything else is. Um, now, uh, including things like hate speech and offensive speech. Uh, it's, hate speech is illegal in other countries, but not in the United States. Um, so you have the right to say things that people don't like. You have Right, say things that people consider to be hateful. Uh, again, you can't, you know, as the example says, burn a cross on someone's lawn with the intent to, you know, get them to move. But, you know, if you want to express your political views that happen to be, you know, what most people would consider hateful, you do have the right to do that in the United States. Uh, okay, what about speech in school? Speech in schools, there are some, some more limits, which I'll go through real quick, because again, we're kind of short on time. Uh, number one, schools can punish or censor speech that's likely to seriously disrupt school. The classic one that there's a lot of cases about this in which maybe there's a school, there's been some, some uh, you know, fights between people of different races, and then a student comes to school with say a Confederate flag t-shirt. Uh, and so schools say, no, you can't, you can't wear that because that's gonna cause even more problems. You know, that student probably, you know, does not have the right to wear that t-shirt in that school. Outside school, sure. In the school, probably not. Um, a swearing, profane speech, students can, a school can punish students for, uh, for swearing on campus or for wearing things that are profane. Sometimes schools take this too far. We had a case few months ago in which a, uh, a student, I think she was in middle school, was wearing a t-shirt that said, uh, virginity rocks. And the school said, you can't wear that. And we wrote a letter saying, hey, what's, you know, of course you can wear that. And they said, oh no, it's profane. Well, no, it isn't, right? But, but you'll find that uh, school district employees often don't know what student rights are. And students often don't know what their rights are, which is kind of what our job is, to let you guys know what your rights are. Uh, and then uh, third, schools can punish speech which advocates like illegal drug use, uh, but not speech that advocates that drugs should be legal, for example. And then finally, uh, schools can censor school publications uh, like yearbooks or school newspapers because it's the school's publication, it's not yours. Um, okay, what does that have to do with, with student dress and appearance? Most of these rules would not apply to that, right? And if you're expressing your gender identity, uh, is that gonna disrupt school? Probably not. Is it, is it profane? No. Uh, you know, is it uh, a school sponsored speech? Is it a school newspaper? No. Uh, so generally speaking, you can probably express your gender any way you want to on campus, you know, especially using clothing. Um, the practical matter, a lot of uh, courts have okayed, you know, dress codes, but generally only when they apply to everyone. 
like no hats or no short pants. Uh, I used to teach high school and we had, there was a no hats rule. I couldn't ever figure out what the point of that was, but you know, we had it, it was legal. Uh, I don't know why I should care why a student wears a hat, but anyway, that rule is okay. But of course, if you look a little more askance at dress codes that apply to certain students, like, uh, you know, boys can wear pants, but girls can't. That might not be so legal. Um, again, going real quickly, um, those rules only apply to public schools. Private schools can do whatever they want because the Constitution does not limit what private people can do, only what the government can do. Now, recently, as people probably know, Twitter banned President Trump. Uh, was that a violation of the First Amendment? No, because Twitter is not the government. Twitter can do whatever they want. Uh, that being said, there's at least one state, which is California, in which state law says that private high schools and universities and colleges have to give students the same rights as students in public school. Uh, so if you're in California and go to a private school, uh, it's handy to know that. Um, finally, one, you know, one big issue that uh, is, is very big lately is, you know, can schools punish students for things they say off campus? Like on social media, it's been very big recently because most students are, are not on campus, right, for the last several months. And the school board is actually going to be deciding that very issue sometime, uh, should be before June. And then just, just to wrap up, uh, you know, just to clarify, uh, we've talked, I've talked to you about what the law is, but your film does not have to be about the law. It can be if you want. That would be great. I'd love it personally, but it does not have to be about the law. Uh, we had a presentation on democracies, but again, your presentation does not have to be a democracy. It can be live action, it can be animation. This is the free expression film contest, so we want you to express yourself in any way you think uh, is best for you. Uh, anyway, if there are any questions, again, put them in the chat, or if questions come up later, uh, you can email me at the email address there, which I won't read out because everyone nice and can read it. Uh, but again, uh, Thank you, and right now we're going to go to the questions. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to read some of the questions, so there's a little bit of leadership here. Um, so our first question is, um, from Robert, who asks, for shooting with smartphones, is there any setup or equipment list that you would recommend? Um, phone, microphones, lenses, or any other helpful specific accessories? So I know the question again. So for invaluable uh, shooting with smartphones? Shooting with smartphones, are there any sort of specific mm -hmm. um, bits so, of equipment or accessories? Yeah, thank you. Th th thank you for um, saying it again. I would say there's no like specific, there's, there's not a particular uh, manufacturer that I recommend, but I would say there are things that you could do that would greatly enhance. Number one, um, audio. Uh, as you know, as uh, Professor Swift uh, outlined, there have been many feature films that you've seen that have had theatrical release. Uh, some amazing uh, projects, amazing content, and they were shot on the iPhone, but I promise you they were not recorded, the sound on the iPhone. And so I think if you're going to get anything additional, if you have a budget for additional gear, um, some type of uh, audio acquisition system. Now, it could be as simple as um, a, a plug-in microphone, because that's really what the issue is. It's not like how it actually captures, not how it actually writes the the, the media, um, but it's all about the acquisition system, the microphone, and any camera or smartphone is going to have what we call an omnidirectional mic, and that so it picks up sound in all directions, and that's not really what you want. You want something that is more unidirectional or or cardoid, hard shaped, um, and you can point that at the subject matter. So, you know, if you just do like an Amazon search, or if you went on say like B and H um, or any of these websites and just did, you know microphones that you could plug in for uh, a smartphone um, something like that would, would work for you um, I think it's important that you have 
you know, something to stabilize the unit. So whether that's a small tripod um, or like a gimbal system that gives it some fluidity if you're moving about, if you're gonna if you're gonna do like a handheld and really operate it with some movement. Um, so that could be very helpful. Uh, and then, like I said, there's, there are different lens packages. They range from like 20 bucks to a couple hundred bucks, depending on the quality of the glass. Um, but the lenses give you the ability to really kind of manipulate that image and, and again, kind of creating, you know, that visual metaphor of which I spoke um, with the example of Lumet's uh, film. So those are the ones I, I don't like have any particular brand that I endorse. Um, obviously, the lens manufacturers, there are ones that are, are pretty well known, um, but they tend to be higher end. So I would say just do your research and make sure that you're reading reviews on it. Make sure that's actually compatible with your particular make and model. Um, but at the end of the day, if, if you just were to whip out the phone and you had just the phone to, uh, to work with, it's powerful enough. You have enough uh, firepower in your pocket. That's what I wanted to weigh in on. All the rest of it is dress up. Don't let it stop you start shooting. It's actually shocking how good the sound is on most of the smartphones. When we do the micro, shop, uh, micro docs workshops, um, most students just shoot with the sound that comes in from their phones and it, it's great. So the rest of it's enhancement. Number one rule, make the movie. Yes. That's a very good rule. Um, we have a question um, about the film contest topic itself. So would discussing um, transgender expression issues fit the theme of the contest? Gordon? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I would only say that the, the question does uh, ask uh, participants to talk about how appearance relates to their identity. So, you know, a, a film in which you are, you know, Driving to the rooftops and proclaiming your uh, your identity probably would not quite fit the topic. So there has to be some element of of how your appearance uh, expresses your identity. That makes sense. So like visual expression of right. of gender identity um, and how that can be um, dealt with in schools potentially. Um, so then the follow up question there is: Is it possible to make a film with just one person? if you're isolated due to the pandemic. I can do that one. I have a lot of students making films with just one person. With people who are completely in lockdown um, in Italy, couldn't leave, their, couldn't leave their house, had to do it like by herself, but with, you can do interviews via Zoom. Um, you can use footage that you've shot at some other point. Um, we've had uh, students get their subjects to shoot footage for them on their iPhones. Um, you can, you know, actually use uh, uh, archival footage off the internet if you follow the laws on that. I mean, there's so many ways. You could just turn around and point at yourself. The ones that you just saw that Sarah did, the one about um, growing up in Zimbabwe and having to leave Zimbabwe, and also the one um, intersection, uh, what it means to be a black woman. She made both of those by herself in complete lockdown um, in in London. So she had some of it was footage and photos from her family, but a lot was pulled off the net. And um, she interviewed people, she had people all around the world doing the interviews that were coming through uh, phones and Zoom and you, you can do it. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think that does it for questions. So I had a question for the for the NIFA people. Uh, on that on that topic, so um, you know, if uh, if someone is wanting to use images they find on the net or what have you, do you have some sort of a a resource where they can go to find some? They don't want to get in trouble for copyright violations or what have you. Do you guys happen to know, or, or you know, if there's a there are sort of images that people can use and not have to worry about that sort of stuff? Uh, it's, it's a big question, um, the, the, or I should say it has a big answer. Um, let me try to boil it down. So there's there's an idea, something called fair use, um, which ties into speech. It's perfectly aligned here, um, which is it sort of takes on the the conflict, the potential conflict between private property, i.e., intellectual property, in this particular case, and freedom of speech. 
And the, the answer that people have come to, that the Supreme Court has come to, is that speech is slightly more important than private property rights. So there are ways that you can actually use a lot of things for free if you are commenting on them, using them as part of a quote, substantially changing them, not using that much of them. Um, so there are a fair amount of things you can just pull. Um, there are, uh, for the most part, things that came out on hot news, uh, uh, it's very hard for them to enforce any kind of ownership rights because they were given all kinds of room on the free speech end. Uh, hot news is bulletproof. They can do anything they want. They can shoot anything they want. They can steal anything they want because the government has decided that the freedom of press is more important than any of the rest of it. But it also means that it's very hard for them to claim uh, exclusivity on the stuff that they shot. So you can usually steal stuff off of hot news. Um, you, you know, anybody on YouTube, it's been amazing to me how free people have been on YouTube. You see something you like, just shoot them an email. And very often they just say, yeah, sure, use it. And they, they may want a credit, they may want a link, um, but they'll often agree to that. There are things called uh, public domain, which is stuff that belongs to everybody. Most stuff that was generated by the US government is public domain because you already paid for it. Uh, right with your tax dollars. Um, I'll try. I'll I'll get a couple of links to paste in while whoever answers the next question. Yeah, I was gonna say one more thing too. As far as like uh, stock footage and like if you need footage and stuff, I always use thing called Pexels. It's like Pixels but with an E. It's all free. If you're not looking to like pay for a bunch of stock footage, it's ten out of ten. Literally, I use it all the time on all my projects and stuff. So highly, highly suggest it's all fair to use. It's all free. There's no, there's no strings attached or anything, but Pexels very, very, very highly recommend that. Thank you. Um, okay, let's do one more. We have one more under the wire question. Um, aspect ratio, cinematic black bars on the top and bottom or stick with 16 and nine? Um, I think we could all probably have an answer to that. We might all have different answers because that really does come down to, you know, the, the, the creative choice that you're making for your film. Um, unless maybe I'm missing something, unless there's some kind of requirement, uh, from, from the, the coalition against censorship, but there's not right. So no, so it's really just, again, like, what do you, you know, every choice you make creative choice should be founded in, um, should be serving the story. And so is there a reason for the more cinematic with the black bars on top and bottom? Are you trying to say something about uh, the landscape and the space and maybe using negative space uh, on the different edges of the frame? Um, you know, or, I mean, so again, really, you, it's hard to kind of give you advice without knowing the context. It's like, you know, for what story, um, for what platform. Um, but if it's just a personal preference, uh, I'll say 69. But anybody else want to jump in on, on that one? Yeah, I mean, it just depends on what the project is. If it demands four by three, then do four by three. If it's 16.9, do 16.9. If it, if you pull, uh, what's that one film? Uh, Mommy, is that it? Where it goes, for, it changes aspect ratios a whole bunch of different times, even sometimes in the frame, you know, or you have Grand Budapest Hotel, which is just more cut, but it's just, it's what the project is. There is no right or wrong way to do it. Um, I mean, I think if you're going to have it in, in movie, if you're trying to have it in movie theaters, um, having a more cinematic widescreen aspect ratio can be beneficial. If it's online, I typically use 16.9 because that's the obviously the aspect ratio of most devices. But do what you want. <laughs> do what you want. That's a very good answer. Do what you want. Um, I want to thank Sage and Molly, um, Andrea and Jonathan, and Gordon for all being here today. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Um, we hope that all of you have learned some interesting stuff. I certainly have. And um, that you will check out the uh, Youth Free Expression Film Contest. Um, the, uh, the URL should be somewhere in the chat, but it is ncac.org slash film dash contest. Um, or you can just search film contest at ncac.org and you will find all the details. Um, submissions are due May 1st. So you have time, but not a ton. Um, and we hope to see some great films. So thank you all for joining us today. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks a lot.